Okie dokie. Well, welcome everybody. Thanks so much for joining um, this episode of the Virtual Health Tug. We have an awesome lineup today with a bunch of great speakers. So we're gonna get right into it. I hope this thing works for me though. All right, cool. So if you've never joined the Health Tug before, we have a large group of co-leads here, some of which are not on right at this moment. Uh, I'm Lindsay Betzendahl. We also have Nicole Lohr, who will be on later in the meeting, uh, Simon Beaumont and Mark Connolly, both of whom of which are happen to be on vacation, but you probably all remember them if you've been at our talk before. And we have new co-lead. I get this. This is just for everybody. Hold on a second. <laughs> Mark is a Prezi. Uh, well. I'm not going to be able to figure this out, apparently. There we go. We have a new co-lead, uh, Nicole Lillian Mark. She's a data visualization engineer at cart.com. And I know she's, um, right now, might be managing her dogs. Unless you're there, Nicole, want to give a hi. She might not be there. But she'll be, she is on, and uh, we welcome her to the team. Okay, so today's talk, um, we have a bunch of speakers as I mentioned today. But we're gonna start off with uh, Zach Bowders, visionary and public ambassador. Uh, he's gonna give us a talk on visionary velocity, which I'm super excited about. Uh, and after that, we have guests Toby Sharp and Jack Perry from the data school. So they're gonna give us some information about the information lab and some speed tipping, which um, should be really fun as well. And then our own new co-lead, Nicole and Mark, We'll be talking about visualizing public health data and some special considerations. So awesome today. Um, so just as some reminders, uh, if anyone has um, questions, please put those in the Q&A. We'll be monitoring that. Uh, and then you're obviously welcome to, to chat and um, say where you're from and you know, welcome everybody on this lovely Thursday. Sorry about this. Um, so before we get started, I um, just want to show some health uh, visualizations that have been shared in the recent um, month or months. Um, so this one was by Pradeep Kumarji, uh, the cannabis exposures, which happen to be a part of Project Health Biz, which I run. So if you hadn't seen this, I may want to check it out. It's a pretty cool stream graph that I thought um, did a really great job on. Um, I think I have one other to show. This was by Lilia Razik. Um, the beginning of a new life. And this was in honor of one of her friends who had a baby and she uh, kept track of her weight every single day. And so looking at the growth of her new child. So that was a very nice inspiring one as well. And obviously if anything else comes up, if you've seen any great health visits that you wanna share, please let us know. We're always looking for um, influential and inspiring visualizations regarding health and healthcare. A couple of things, just some Tableau events coming up in the community. Um, if you haven't seen the My Tableau story, um, I think there's been four so far. I recently did one, and then there's more coming up where you get to see some of the community members and their uh, Tableau journeys. They're, they're really inspiring stories. Um, Adam Miko was on, uh, Jim, um, Annabelle, a number of people in the community. And also, if you don't know, their Tableau ambassador nominations are also open now through July 21st. So go in and nominate yourself, nominate others and inspire you. Um, there's a number of different types of ambassadors, so go check those out as well at tableau.com. Just Google on their blog. It was um, just shared the other day. We also want to um, note some two additional upcoming Viz product projects uh, related to health. Um, the Veterans Advocacy Tug actually reached out to us yesterday, explained that they have a data challenge, uh, that they're partnering with Hunter7 um, to look at um, some information related to veterans and uh, I think care with nurses. Um, so if you're interested in participating with them, they would love the support. Uh, you can find more at this GitHub and obviously this presentation will be available afterwards. So if you need those links, I can also drop them in the chat later. And also Project Health Biz, which I run, the July data is coming out for rural hospital closures. Um, so if you're interested in participating ever in Project Health Biz, let me know. And um, these are great opportunities to practice visualizations and getting involved with the community. And lastly, before we get going, is just a reminder for our next hug. It's going to be September 28th. 
We have John Schwabish, Dev Fosale, and Nicole Klassen coming on. So another great lineup of speakers. So make sure you mark that down and register when it's available. And now I am going to stop sharing. That way I don't have to do it again. <laughs> and I am going to toss this over to the fantastic Zach Bowders for our first presentation. And again, we'll monitor the Q&A and have some time afterward for that. Um, so just drop anything in there. All right, Zach. Welcome hey, thanks, Lindsay. Uh, thanks for having me, everybody. So um, I'm doing a uh, whirlwind tour of this, and I'm actually doing this at the analytics tour in about an hour as well. So uh, uh, hopefully, uh, you know, you, you guys aren't the dry run. You're the main show. They're the after party. So um, I'm Zach Bowders. This presentation is Visionary Velocity, Improving Your Skills, Speed, and Thinking Through Public Work. So as I said, that's me. I am a BI specialist at JLL, Jones Lang LaSalle. We're a global uh, real estate properties company. We have 91,000 global employees and I'm part of the America's BI team. You probably know a bunch of folks that work there. We have at least four Tableau visionaries and about 12 or more ambassadors at this point. We have a really, really big, robust analytics team and we're always building it out. So if you're curious about that, reach out to me. I am a two-time Tableau visionary, formerly Zen master, two-time Tableau ambassador, Seven time, visit the day, busy winter. Uh, but my, my real thing is I love doing the Data Plus Love podcast uh, where I have members of the Data Fam on and other data folks. Recently, I had Alex Selby Boothroyd on from The Economist uh, where he was talking about data journalism. So it's a great opportunity to see different aspects of data and the data community. So Edward Tufte famously said, PowerPoint presentations too often resemble a school play, very loud, very slow, and very simple. And if you were to take a little snap of that QR code right there. You could navigate to Tufty's circa 2003 era webpage. Um, by the way, he now exclusively presents in PowerPoint. So I'm wondering how that's sort of, you know, aged. Having said that, this is all going to be in PowerPoint. So buckle up, folks. This is virtual. Um, I not so famously said, I'm not going to waste my time doing this if I'm not having fun. Uh, to which I also said there's a 10 billion percent chance you're going to burn out unless you find a method of learning that invigorates and inspires you. And that's really my personal journey. Um, starting off with the Tableau community and public data visualization, I had to find ways that kept me engaged. So I know some people are real sticklers to presentations and expect stuff to be orderly and businessy and I guess I can do that. So here you go. Th this is what to expect. We're going to be talking about public work collaboration and finding or creating your niche. So if you're those uh, bullet point sticklers, uh, keep your eye open for these and uh, let's do this. So everybody starts somewhere and that's not going to be the same place for everybody. So if you're sort of well seasoned in data visualization, have done a lot of public work, or if you haven't, um, that's fine because honestly, everyone starts somewhere and no one's first public work looks the same. So right here, we're seeing some work from Jared Flores uh, this year, actually. Um, you know, this looks a lot like what Jared was producing at work at the time. It's sort of clean and businessy and matter of fact, it, the colors are very staid and it's got great use of white space. You can look at other people's first work too. So this is Judith Becker, who's a Tableau visionary like me. And uh, her first work was a lot more artistic and kind of cartoony and creative, very vivid colors, lots of graphics and that sort of thing. Not the kind of stuff she's probably doing at work. And then you see Luke Abrahams, which honestly just frankly kind of blew my mind. You know, this, this was his first public work and everything in his uh, portfolio is, is equally as good. But he came on very fully formed, very mature and sophisticated. And public work isn't necessarily an indication of, you know, just because it's the first thing you've done publicly doesn't mean you haven't been doing this for years. And it doesn't mean you don't already know what you're doing to a degree. Um, however, for other people, it might mean they're earlier on in their journey and they're trying to find an outlet to get reps in, be creative or try new things. So this was my first Tableau public visualization. Uh, it looks very much like the kind of dashboard I was doing at work at the time, with the exception of the giant picture of M. Night Shyamalan and movie tickets on it. We we're doing a lot of, uh, you know, dual axis charts, maybe with Gantt bars or something to compare actuals versus budget. We were doing these sort of fact call outs you see at the bottom, and those would actually, you know, populate differently depending on what the numbers came in as. So if I were to go refresh that right now and add on, I don't know, whatever uh, Shyamalan's last couple of movies are, like that beach one that wasn't very good. 
um, you know, we would see these numbers uh, update in the charts at the bottom update as well. So I made this when I didn't even know Tableau Public was a thing yet. And if you don't know Tableau Public is a thing, I'm kind of glad you're here. I mean, we've got 223 participants at this point. Somehow you find, found your way to a virtual tug and you don't know what Tableau Public is. So that's awesome. But beyond that, I didn't know that there was an outlet for me to create stuff that wasn't for work and to put it somewhere. I actually created this on a whim at work one day. So I was thinking, I really like data visualization. I really like using Tableau. What if I could use that for other things? So I made this and then I was, you know, digging around in Tableau and I discovered this Tableau public publish button. I'm like, I don't even know what this is, but let's go for it. So I put it out there and I mistakenly, you know, used the wrong hashtags and fell backwards into a community. And here I am now years later, but this is my 200th viz. So I'm out now past that. I'm, I guess I'm like 205, 206. So it's a lot different, right? It's, you know, still colorful, still kind of poppy, still covering pop culture topics. It's a more difficult chart type, although once you figure out how to use those Sankey templates by the Fleurlidge brothers, it's not that hard to do. But uh, it's it's an evolution. Like I've, I've sort of changed my style, changed how I work, and I've gotten faster and better. Um, and that's not necessarily all indicated by my public work. A lot of my public work is simpler. And to a degree, that's intentional. And I'm going to get to that in a second. But the main comparison between these two things is curiosity, that I didn't stop learning and I didn't stop changing and trying new things. And I didn't stop investigating stuff that interested me. So if you're old like me, you may have played the legend of Zelda at some point as a child. And if not, you probably have at least heard of the legend of Zelda. And if you haven't heard of the legend of Zelda, I don't, I can't help you here, but it's a classic video game for Nintendo. And uh, at the very beginning of the game, you start off as this little guy link in the bottom corner of the screen. And you don't have anything. You don't have any weapons or anything. But the first thing you see, there's like a little cave. It's like a little black square in the upper left corner of the screen. If you go in there, there's this old man who, in this case, we're going to say is Tableau. And he says, it's dangerous to go alone. Take this. And he gives you a sword. Well, you know, Tableau is the tool here. Tableau is kind of the old man. But Tableau is not the sword. The sword is the community that surrounds Tableau. So unlike many communities that surround software products, um, Tableau's community, while it is supported by Tableau as a company, and obviously there's awards that they give out like Visionary and Ambassador, so much of it is generated from grassroots from the ground up. So, so many of the best tools for learning and growing are actually created by individuals and not actually directly created by Tableau. So I swear I didn't get, steal this quote, or maybe I did, um, but really the best thing you can do for yourself in terms of growing is to be selfish and to help others. Uh, but we'll get back to that in a second. But there's so many different opportunities out there. And if you check out some of these hashtags, back to Viz Basics, Tableau, FF, Project Health Viz, like Lindsay mentioned, there's so many different opportunities for you to interact with others and try new things and practice with data publicly and grow. Now, the temptation may be like, well, I can do that stuff on my own, right? Like, I'll just take one of these data sets and make it myself. And I'll save it to my my personal desktop or whatever, and that'll be good. And that is good to a degree, like you will learn stuff by doing new things, but you're not gonna learn in the same way that you will by interacting with others. And I'm gonna cover that in a second. So this graphic is totally meaningless, but you know, this is a PowerPoint presentation, so get used to that. Um, Napoleon Hill once said, it's literally true that you can succeed best and quickest by helping others to succeed. So I've said before, um, it's quietly one of the most hedonistic things you can do to enjoy other people's success. Like it's really tempting when you see other people to succeed, to feel jealous of them, but reality is not a zero sum game just because someone else won doesn't mean you've lost. So when you see other people growing and doing great things, you have the opportunity to both be happy for them, but to also say, Hey, that's really cool. I bet I could do that too. And that's one of the best things about doing work publicly, not only, do you get the opportunity to see what other people have done? They get the opportunity to see what you've done and you can all grow together. So, uh, you know, there's a movie out this summer with like a 59 year old pilot. Um, but there's a lot that can be learned from Maverick or uh, Pete Maverick Mitchell, I believe, as he's known in the movie. So Maverick is arguably the best pilot, but he's also kind of, you know, reckless, but there's some stuff you can take away from him. So Maverick didn't start off knowing how to fly a plane. Someone had to teach him. So at some point he was learning from others. Later, 
Maverick is collaborating with others. He's flying with wingmen like Iceman and, you know, he's got his co-pilot goose. And then later Maverick is actually leading others. So while Maverick is not a commanding officer, he's not an admiral or a senator. He's, he's leading amongst the other pilots. So he is able to both inspire, encourage, and help others grow all the while still being an individual contributor. So there's a lot of opportunity for you to learn from others and then give back to others all the while still being peers. You don't have to be above anyone else. And one of the nice things about Tableau's public community is it's not super hierarchical in the sense that Lindsay and I are both Tableau visionaries, which is one of the biggest honors you can receive from Tableau. But at the same time, we're just folks like everyone else. And if you want to talk to us, just say hi, or if you want me to check out your project, I'd be happy to. So collaboration has been one of my key things to personal success. So I'm going to tell you the story of three different things I collaborated on with three different people, Kate, Adam, and Sarah, and how I've learned from different opportunities. So I met Kate on Twitter a couple of years ago, but we really hit it off at Tableau Conference 2019 in Las Vegas. And we were both looking for an opportunity to collaborate on something. We just didn't know what. So we we're trying to find a common topic that we're both interested in. And the subject of Girl Scouts and Girl Scout cookies in particular came up because I've got two girls, neither of them are interested in the Scouts, but they have lots of friends that are. And you, know, you feel like you're constantly being shaken down to buy cookies. And I was like, everywhere I go, these cookies are being sold by essentially what's you know, free child labor. But where's all the money going and how much is there? So if you actually go on the Girl Scouts website, they have all the stats listed for you about how much money they bring in, which is about $800 million annually, which is a lot of money. And then where this goes. So we both worked iteratively on the same Tableau workbook, you know, sort of exploring the idea, the different charts we could use, the different graphics we could incorporate, and passing a dashboard back and forth, which Tableau isn't necessarily the best tool for collaborative building, but it gave us an opportunity to learn more about doing that. So we talked about what kind of cookies are there, how much of sales do they account for? And actually, if you look at the curvy timeline that we built throughout the dashboard, every single one of those gives you a different fact about the Girl Scouts from their websites. You can hover on them and learn more as you go. In the middle, we have a graphic and circ circling, I think it's a tag along, about where all the money goes. So 27% of the money is going back to the bakery. So you know that's cost for working. 53% goes to the council. So more than half of this is sort of going to executive overhead. And then about 5% goes back to the girls individually with 15% going to the troops. Uh, themselves, which are sort of the units the girls operate in. So I was always wondering, like, how come my friends are always having to pay for new uniforms and vests and all of this? And it's because not as much of it's making back down to the level of the individual girl as you think. So families of Girl Scouts are still having to pay quite a bit. And we actually included some cookies at the bottom, which if you click on them, give you different opportunities to give both to Girl Scouts, either sort of corporately or at more individual levels to help other Girl Scouts get along. So this was a cool opportunity for me to both expand my skills because I learned a lot of different techniques from Kate that she was using that I don't normally use and also practice building something together with someone else where you don't have full control of it. And you have to sort of learn to both collaborate in terms of style, but also compromise in terms of vision. With Adam, Adam, who's you know often known as the data fam mayor now, started off with a blog and early on in his blog, he asked me if I'd be willing to contribute, you know, sort of a gonzo journalist, Hunter S. Thompson style article. Um, and I said, that's not something I've ever done before, but sure. So I, uh, I talked with Adam and about kind of what he was looking for and how he would like me to do this and sort of with him as an editor, and me as a you know writer, I put together uh, this article. And it's a good opportunity for me to flex different muscles than I normally do because when I'm typically you know at work, I'm working with clients and creating dashboards and documentation. When I'm having fun, I'm creating dashboards like the one you see on the page, but I'm not often talking about them as much. And I wouldn't be talking about them as much until I later started a podcast. So it was an opportunity for me to try to learn how to talk about what I was doing why I was doing it and what the thinking behind it was. With Sarah, who operates Iron Quest, which is kind of a leg day for um, Iron Viz, which is you know our big annual competition at Tableau Conference. Every month they have a different exercise, which is themed, and it gives people the opportunity to try different techniques and different ideas that they don't normally dip into so that later when they're competing in Iron Viz or 
maybe have to do it at work. It's not the first time they've done it. So Sarah asked me if I would help her co-host for a mobile first challenge. So mobile is something we often don't develop for in Tableau. I know if you're like me, oftentimes one of the first things you do when you're starting your dashboard is go and turn off the mobile view because you don't want to have to deal with that. So not only did I have to build a mobile visual visualization for this, which I did in the middle, the weird yellow one, where uh, me and Luke Stanky went back and forth on Twitter asking people which was better, uh, tacos or pizza. Um, people voted pizza and they're wrong. Um, but I then got to participate in the review, which was a several hour video of us looking at and talking about all of the different submissions and you know, giving feedback. And giving feedback is a challenging thing because you want to say things that are helpful to people and can sort of help them grow. And you never want to undercut someone's sort of spirit. Like you don't want to take that away from them. Very early in my career, I once had a boss that told me that he didn't find me interesting and that people he didn't find interesting typically don't go anywhere. And that really threw me off for at least three years in terms of my, my personal journey, how I thought about myself and sort of how I operated within that company. So learning to give feedback, especially in sort of such a vision, visible way is a, is a, is a unique skill that is worth practicing. I know for me, typically if I'm giving feedback to someone, it's either one-on-one -on -one or in a very small situation. And that's quite different from doing it on a video where literally hundreds of people might be watching what you said about someone's visualization later. So as part of my journey, I started to think about well, what do I care about? So what kind of things are things that interest me and sort of make me passionate? And among those are things like podcasting, design, pop culture, stuff like that. That's the stuff that, you know, really sort of makes Zach, that, that feeds me and, and sustains me and makes me interested in stuff. So here's some things I didn't care about um, that I made and that are sort of embarrassing and I'm not super proud of. So uh, on the left, you can see a Christmas spending uh, in America. And all these are actually from Makeover Monday, which is uh, one of the more famous Tableau public exercises, which is now sort of retired, but it was a weekly exercise where every week there's a public data set. Everyone would take about an hour. That was the suggestion. I know a lot of people didn't do that. And the idea was, oh, go make something and um, maybe it's best practices. I know that's what they hoped for, but in a lot of cases it wasn't. And in many of these cases that you see here, these are examples of me taking a data set that I didn't particularly care about and wasn't particularly interested in and trying to find a way to make it interesting to me and to amuse myself. And you can tell that my heart's not really in most of these um, in the sense that I'm trying to be overly cutesy, I'm cluttering stuff up with clip art, I'm going a little nuts with the colors, the Blackhawks up one about the Chicago Blackhawks and how their attendance took off. That's about the only one of these that actually I'm not totally mortified by. But the, these are all examples of things that I was making because I wanted to be part of the conversation and I wanted to sort of you know, practice but it's not stuff I cared about. So it's not stuff that turned out super great and that I don't care about anymore. So why am I not doing the things that I care about? Why am I not doing podcasting, design, and pop culture? You know, it's if, if these are the things that sustain me and make me excited and make me interested. If I'm not doing stuff that makes me excited, am I going to keep doing this? Am I going to keep practicing and growing? Not really. And you see a lot of people sort of burn out and fall off. And now everyone has lots of reasons. But I suspect a lot of it comes down to if you're not doing something that you would do anyway, you're not going to keep doing it. So here are examples of things I did care about. On the left, you see one where it's about the Scoville scale of hot peppers. And while I did incorporate this sort of curvy chart on the left, which really means nothing to the left of Chili's counts, it did give me an opportunity to play around with the idea of finding a balance between both representing the scale of the pepper heat against an eye-catching visual that resembled the eye of a stove. So sometimes you're able to make stuff that's best practices and looks awesome and it's very simple, but no one looks at it because there's no, there's nothing to grab them. And there's definitely a balance to be found in the middle there. And this was me playing around with that idea. On the top right, you see me trying to map something that's not mappable, which is the idea of dreams. So in the movie Inception, there is a story that involves a dream within a dream within a dream. And I remember sitting around one day thinking, how do you express that idea? Like if you were to try to draw this out on a piece of paper, how would you do that? 
So I actually found a way to do that. And I made that all within Tableau. So it was an opportunity both to think about how do I map an idea that's difficult, but then how do I make that within Tableau in the first place? And the bottom chart is the idea of horror movie franchises and how quickly do they begin to fall off in quality? So in the upper left corner, you've got the ones that were the most consistent, highly rated. And then by the time you work your way all the way to the upper right-hand corner, you get to the Leprechaun franchise, which almost immediately went to hell. So it's different ideas of different things. And you know, obviously getting playful with like the bottom right corner looking like candy corn in terms of the color. So trying to find different ways to represent different ideas that both work visually in an interesting way and kept me interested in learning new techniques, but also could convey an idea clearly. So something else I care about is data and data community and learning more about others. And as I would go to Tableau conferences, as around the third one I went to in Tableau uh, 2019 in Las Vegas, I realized one of the things I looked forward most to at the conference was interacting with others and sort of building community, understanding what they work on, what's, what matters to them, and getting to know the people behind the stuff that I thought was so cool. Um, and I realized that I felt starved for that during a lot of the rest of the year. I had a few like local colleagues that I'd get to talk to, but for the most part, I wasn't having those conversations regularly. So I thought, you know, I love listening to podcasts. I wonder if I could do a podcast. So I learned how to record one. I spent about a month learning how to edit and figured out the resources I would need to actually start one. And then in beginning of 2020, not too long before COVID hit, I started a podcast called Data Plus Love. Ever since then, every two weeks, I've released an episode. And most of those episodes are me one-on-one -on -one just having a conversation, usually with someone from the Tableau community, sometimes not. Uh, and sometimes there are solo episodes where I'm covering different topics and delving into different ideas. But it gave me an opportunity both to have those conversations that I needed to fuel me and keep me excited, and also a way to highlight some of the people that I found interesting and help others get to know sort of the face behind the visualizations that they were seeing and that they liked. So in a way, bringing other people into the conversation and hopefully helping other people sort of build their own personal networks. So Mike Cisneros, who is a former Tableau uh, Zen master, had a presentation he did at Tableau Conference a few years ago. And uh, in it, he quotes a Broadway show called Title of Show, which had a song called Nine People's Favorite Thing. And the lyrics you can see on the left, I'd rather be nine people's favorite thing than 100 people's ninth favorite thing. And one of the challenges about doing public visualization work is everyone wants to be loved, right? Like everyone would like people to see your work and, and praise it and like it and feel connected to it. Like no one does stuff because they want people to not like them. And, you know, you're, you're doing it because, you know, you want to grow and you want to express yourself and you want to do these projects, but also wouldn't it be great if people actually like this? And I realized for me in many of those early projects I was doing, especially those three makeover Mondays I showed you, and this is in no way a knock against makeover Monday, because I wasn't invested in it, because I didn't care about it, I was doing stuff for the wrong reasons sometimes. And I needed to find ways to do stuff that mattered to me. And that oftentimes when stuff really mattered to me and I was investing in it and making something that I really liked, other people liked it too. And maybe not as many people as would have liked it if I had you know, chosen more sort of broadly popular things. But I was finding a community and well, it might be nine people rather than a hundred, those people that were connecting to my stuff more were connecting to it on a higher level than people that might have connected more casually. So this is kind of my career progression. Actually, I recently found back in 2016 a picture from my very first Tableau training ever. I flew to New York. Uh, Tiffany Spaulding was my Tableau instructor, and I had a two-day crash course in Tableau, and I loved it. 2017 is when I had my first uh, public viz at M. Night Shyamalan viz. Less than two years later, I had 100 vizs. Shortly after that, I had a podcast, I was a Tableau ambassador, and then 2021, I became a Tableau Zen master and now a Tableau visionary as we've changed the title. So it's very rarely do people just have a sort of have a meteoric rise, like you start and then within the year, you know, you're getting like a lot of traction and you're seeing really seeing you know, uh, personal growth as well as maybe public recognition, but it is possible. And if you actually look at your own personal timeline, yours may not be the same as mine, but you will see some kind of growth and progression at the very least from doing public work far before I was ever being recognized as a Tableau ambassador. I was noticing that I was able to do stuff faster at work.
And oftentimes uh, when a problem presented itself, I had an idea of how to accomplish it quicker than I did when I was just sort of only doing stuff at work. So for those sticklers at the beginning that needed the bullet points, I talked about public work and the need to do stuff in public that you're not gonna get the same growth as you would if you did it all by yourself as when you put it out there. Because first, every, every project you do is always gonna be public in some capacity. You're releasing it at work, other people are gonna see it. So just keeping stuff to yourself, you're not gonna get the same growth as you would if you had some kind of feedback. Collaboration is important. Finding different ways to work with others helps you grow because you pick up different skills along the way, both from doing the project as well as having to work with someone else. And lastly, finding or creating your niche. For me, it was pop culture, podcasting, all that geeky stuff. For you, it might be something else. There's already a lot of opportunities for different avenues and yours may be something entirely different and it might be something you need to create. And no one's gonna give you permission because no one thinks you need it. Just go out there and do it. It's fine. Like there are, there are no gatekeepers. So this presentation has been visionary velocity. I just want to thank everyone for coming. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. And uh, I will be back as I am working on my next presentation already, which is less you're doing too much and you should stop. So here's how you can reach me. The easiest way, if you want to see all my stuff, is just to go on Twitter at Axtack uh, I have a Google Kaya webpage, which is their new sort of thing in beta testing. And it's got all my links on there, so it's easy to find uh, anything you need from me. And uh, feel free to reach out and say hi. Thanks, Zach. I love hearing like all your advice for folks and how you've <laughs> done so much over the last uh, couple of years. Um, and your podcast is fantastic, as you know. So if folks have not ever listened to Zach's podcast, uh, you, you should go do that. A uh, ton of great content there. Um, and if anyone has any questions for Zach, just drop them in the chat. Um, you know, he can, he can respond. I know most of kind of what you sh shared was kind of your journey and some advice for folks. So people, you know, want to talk to Zach about getting started and getting involved in all that public work. I'm sure he could talk to you about that. Happy to. Cool. Thanks so much. All right, so next we're gonna to toss it over to um, Jack and Toby from the Information Lab and the Data School. Take it away. Let me see if this works. Thank you, that was great, Zach. Really interesting stuff. Um, can everybody, well, can someone confirm that they can see my screen okay? You're good. Great. Okay. Um, well, very exciting to be invited along to get involved here and uh, Thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Toby Sharp, um, head of the data school in New York. Uh, and I'm um, just gonna take a, a quick opportunity to, to introduce ourselves, what we do, and then hand over to, to Jack for the fun stuff. So uh, let me spin through here. Hopefully uh, a, a lot of you already know uh, a bit about the information lab, um, but uh, maybe less so about the data school and specifically the data school in North America. Um, so just to, to recap, um, the information lab as an organization has been around for about 11 years uh, and we were very ad early adopters in terms of, of Tableau and actually one of the first uh, Tableau training partners in, in Europe. Um, we are dog partner to, to Tableau and also um, uh, partners with, with Altrix as well. And, uh, and they're the, the kind of primary specialist areas in terms of, of software um, specialization. Uh, additionally, uh, beyond that, we've integrated AWS and, and Snowflake and become partners um, it, it, with both of those and, and added those to our disciplines as well. Uh, and then within the information lab, which has a core team of consultants numbering around 30 in the UK, uh, we in 2015 developed the data school, which has uh, evolved a lot since then and provides the career acceleration program for uh, the next generation of analysts. Just to dive a little deeper on that, um, look through here. Um, this this really is geared towards um, driving career careers for, for um, folks wanting to get into to data professions. Um, we we spent about two years uh, during COVID developing 
um, the New York operation a little bit hindered with uh, the ability to travel and whatnot, but kicked off with a vengeance uh, from January. Um, the data school it essentially operates a close to two and a half year contract for any candidate joining the program. It's uh, fully salaried and paid throughout their time with us. Um, it, it's uh, front loaded with intensive training, class classroom led, led training, um, historically uh, led by Andy Kriebel, who now is our global head of training. Um, Carl Altshin um, took over as uh, head coach in the UK and Ann Jackson joined us in January to take up that role in New York. Um, so once they've gone through that training and become highly certified both in Tableau and in Alteryx, um, they are then placed in four consecutive uh, consulting placements, um, six months apiece to complete the, the two years to follow training. And then we help them to find uh, jobs with our clients. Sometimes they will join our internal team uh, or indeed go out and um, find find jobs about themselves within the, the, the broader data community. So what does this really look like? Um, in terms of those placements, uh, this can transcend uh, content creation, uh, training and enablement activity, uh, building of community within clients, uh, and um, uh, kind of the, 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 the broad um, thing we look at here is really staff augmentation opportunities and, and kind of injecting SMEs into specific teams within our clients. And with that in mind, uh, looking at really the, the advantage that we're bringing here is um, highly certified uh, consultants, like I said, but at a very competitive day rate. Um, and on the way through this, it's really allowing these consultants to transition from training into cutting their teeth uh, as consultants within these clients. Something uh, to consider beyond the six month placement and perhaps a sort of a precursor to that to learn a little bit more about the team and, and the consultants. Uh, each cohort, which numbers eight typically, um, will get an opportunity during their training to run what we call client projects, which say data school project there on screen, DSPs. Uh, and this allows one of the eight to operate as a project manager and have the other seven uh, sit behind to deliver a complimentary week of consulting to our clients or would-be clients uh, to, to kind of show what we can do and, and um, look at sort of art of the possible in terms of what a week can deliver and then what you know 26 weeks could deliver within a six month placement. Um, we also operated these as something we call seeing is believing where some of our more senior ed school consultants um, would sit in for a week uh, as a dedicated consultant with our clients to, again, show what we can do. Thank you. I'm going to follow up. Uh, anybody that has any uh, questions, please uh, drop those in the Q&A and I can jump into those after this before handing over to Jack, um, just to say that I will also add any contact details that would be useful to, to share into the into the chat as well. So please reach out if you uh, have any interest around becoming a client or indeed if you have any candidates that might be uh, viable for joining the program. We would love to hear about both. Toby, can I ask a question? For sure, yeah. It's related to that. Um, so I know you guys are just getting started in New York. Do you already have like a number of clients that you're you're working with? And if so, like how, how did you end up finding them? Are they a range of different industries or are there particular ones you tend to find that work better? Uh, we, we are um, across all verticals. Um, we have worked very closely with, with um, Tableau in terms of engaging uh, customer success uh, managers and looking at ways that we can get in to help them out around enablement, which is a, a good conversation starter for us historically. Um, but we also have carryover from, from clients like JP Morgan, for example, who we have relationships in the UK where that's an easy conversation to begin uh, in the US. But yeah, we're across banking, wealth, insurance, uh, travel, you know, including airlines, um, the, the sort of CMT, comms media tech um, vertical there as well. Uh, so we, I mean, it's actually a, a, a good point to, to reference where we 
place people, we are always considerate of the fact we want them to get a rounded experience of going across different verticals within those placements. So um, that that necessarily has us looking for a, a good blend of, of clients. Um, it's, it's worth noting our relationship, longstanding relationship with uh, JLL as well, uh, since that was just on. And we are, um, you know, in, in, in conversations now in terms of them uh, jumping in and becoming one of our first clients in in um, the US as well. So uh, it will be a good uh, do over of when um, uh, Paul was Paul was involved uh, very much at the front end of data school and, and the evolution in the UK as well. Awesome. So it does sound like if anyone has any, uh, you know, leads for maybe healthcare related uh, clients, um, sounds like you might be able to add that to the portfolio. Uh, someone did have a question. Um, then maybe just answer it quickly live. Um, is the classroom sessions in person only? And then leave that Sorry, up. I just lost my um, headset for a second there. Can you still um, hear me? Is, oh, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, the question was, is the classroom sessions in person only? I think would be they are, yeah. So we are um, asking for folks to be uh, here in, in our Manhattan office at 28 Liberty for those four months. Um, obviously, with regards to uh, the placements, it's, a, it's an interesting time as people go back to, you know, possibly being in person with clients, possibly being hybrid a bit there or a bit with us, and some are going to be entirely virtual. You know, over the last um, 18 months or so, we've been working virtually with our UK team serving US clients. Uh, and so, you know, we're, we're kind of weighing up exactly what that looks like in terms of the, uh, the, the need for, for candidates to be here with us beyond those four months. Um, and, and it will be client led in terms of, of you know, what, what their requirements look like. Awesome. Thanks so much, Toby. And if anyone else has questions, just drop them in the Q&A and uh, Toby should be able to answer them if any come through. Thanks very much. I'll hand over to Jack. Cool. <clears throat> Let me just make sure I'm sharing the right screen. Toby, can you turn your sound off? Because that's really distracting. <laughs> um, right. So hi, everyone. Uh, I'm here to give just a quick 10, 15 minutes of Tableau speed tips. Um, my name is Jack Parry. I am the solution consulting lead here at the Data School in New York. Uh, I'm a Tableau user group ambassador as well. So I run the Tableau prep user group. Um, I also run the New York City Tableau user group. Uh, my Twitter handle is there if you'd like to connect with me. I started my career in data analytics by actually going through the data school program. Um, I joined that in 2018 in London. Uh, so I went through that led by Andy Creeble and Carl Alchin. Uh, went through my placements that Toby just described and then I was actually offered a role at the Information Lab as a full-time consultant following um, that period. I stayed there for a year or so um, and now have moved over to New York to help grow and expand our team out there or here. Um, so we're going to build, <laughs> we're going to build uh, this, or I'm going to build this dashboard really quickly in the next 10, 15 minutes. Um, it's nothing out of the ordinary. Uh, it's just looking at superstore sales, but hopefully you will pick up some tips and tricks along the way. So diving into Tableau, um, because I'm building this quickly and I know how my dashboard wants to look, the first thing that I'm gonna do is change some of the default formatting of the workbook. So um, if we just go to the format menu up here and we go to workbook, we can actually change some of the formatting for dashboards, worksheet titles, worksheets and grid lines um, before we start our analysis. So I'm just gonna, increase the size of some of my worksheet font. Um, we're going to increase the worksheet titles as well, maybe make these um, Tableau book and bold. Um, and then finally, just the dashboard titles as well, we're going to make that bigger. So if you weren't aware, then you can change the formatting of your workbook before you get going. And I'm also going to turn off the grid lines because I don't want some of that clutter on my dashboard. Um, so I'm now going to build out that first bar chart in my view. So I want to find out how much these subcategories can um, mount up to the percentage of total. So this is just focusing on the technology um, category. So I'm just going to stick that on. And we'll just apply this to um, every worksheet that I'm going to build out. 
um, we'll bring my subcategory to rows and we'll drop the sales onto columns. Um, I'll just give that a sort. And I want to show the percentage of total here at the end of the bars, um, but I'm going to do that using a level of detail calculation. Um, now, typically, you might go into your calculated field and start to write out a fixed calculation. So I just want to fix on my category um, and get the total sales. So I can compare the sales of each of these subcategories to that value. But when we know um, exactly which level of detail calculation we want to compute for one dimension, I can just pick sales up. Ooh, hold that is not what I wanted to do. <laughs> um, I can hold command on my Mac on Windows, I believe it's control, pick up sales, uh, drop it onto my category, and you'll see I get a new calculated field appear. And when I open, what's going on here? When I open up that calculation, you see I have my level of detail calculation already formed, ready to go. So now I can just combine this with my sales. So I can just call this percentage total sales. Uh, drag in my sum of sales, put that over that subcategory sales. Um, we'll just make that a sum as well. So we're not getting our aggregate, non-aggregate error. Um, and then I'll just change the default number formatting of this because I know it's going to be a percentage um, and I want that to display as a percentage everywhere. So maybe I'll just make that one decimal place. And now I can drop that onto my labels. Um, I could get rid of these headers now. I don't really need them. Uh, maybe I'll, well, I was going to change it to entire view, but I can't because of <laughs> the zoom toolbar. So that's fine for now. Um, maybe if I just come out of full screen, bring this down a little bit. There we go. Um, actually, we'll leave this as standard for now. Um, if we go back to a sheet there, I think that's everything we want to do just bring this across. I'm not doing a lot of dragging. Um, and finally, I'm just going to rename my worksheet. Hopefully that's not a tip for anyone, but maybe it is. Um, so now we've got that worksheet built out, we're going to look at building our monthly sales. So we're going to be looking at the sales for just 2022, as my dashboard is showing here. Um, and then I want to show whether each of these bars was an increase or decrease on the previous month. So we'll build this out. We'll call this monthly sales. Um, I'm going to show my month order date here. I'll show my total sales. And just for this visualization, I'm going to show these as bars. Uh, just take the size of those. A little different. Um, so I'm sure many of you have computed this kind of thing in the past where you want to show an increase or decrease on the previous value. And there are several ways you might have done that. So you could have this kind of calculation, um, which is using a table calculation. So we're just saying if the sum of sales um, minus our previous sum of sales using that lookup calculation is greater than zero, then that would be an increase. Otherwise, it would be a dec uh, if it's less than zero, it would be a decrease. And otherwise, it's going to be neutral. Um, this is fine. It will work. But using strings here is going to not be such a performant calculation. So if suddenly you've got a quite complex workbook, then you might want to think of doing this in a slightly different way. So a way you might have done that is then by using a very similar calculation uh, and using a Boolean expression. So it's exactly the same, but instead of using my strings of increase, decrease, or neutral, I'm just saying true or false. But we could make that even more efficient by using the sign function. So I create a new calculated field and we'll call this a uh, new increase, decrease sales. Um, and we want to say um, whether my sum of sales 
oh, I want to evaluate the sum of sales minus the lookup of my sum sales. And I want to offset that by minus one. So we're looking back one. And now we can use this sign function. So if I just preview that over here, it's going to return um, one if the value is positive. It's going to return minus one if the value is negative, or it's going to return zero if the number is zero. So this is going to essentially make the computation of that value even quicker. And then just in case we have any nulls, I'll wrap this in a zero null as well. So that's exactly the same calculation or getting to the same kind of output as my string calculation or my Boolean calculation, but just all in one line, really simple. Um, I'm just gonna make that discrete and I could drop that onto color. And now we have our increase or decrease showing on our chart. So I might just change the color of these slightly um, to just be slightly different than that red blue. Um, and now I want to just show for 2022. <laughs> so I'm going to get rid of my values that are before 2022. And there are lots of ways you could do this. You could just filter them out, but that wouldn't be particularly dynamic. Um, so if I just say use my year as filter, then I would be getting rid of those values. But we could do that with um, one, a more dynamic calculation. So we're just going to check that something is this current year. So maybe I'll just call this current year check. Um, and we want to say, is my year of order date, make that bigger so you can see, equal to my fixed max year order date. This may be a tip in itself. So if you're writing a fixed expression, you don't actually, and you're fixing on nothing, you don't actually have to write the word fixed. You can just write your LOD like this. So this is going to give me a true false value. It will return true for everything that's in the maximum year of my data set. It will return false for everything that's not. But if I just use this as a filter, I am going to, let's just show. I'm going to get this orange bar for January because I filtered out all of the data for the years prior to 2022. And so I can't now use my table calculation to evaluate the increase or decrease because there is no value for December 2021. Whereas if I actually use this on columns, I'm now going to have these views split up by true or false. And I can just hide the false. And now I'm still getting that increase or decrease um, against the previous month because the data is still there. It's not filtered out. I just don't see it in my view. Um, we could just tidy this up. I don't need my month order date. Um, maybe we'll get rid of some of the formatting. The row dividers and column dividers. Not a fan of those. Um, and then finally on this view, we want a little indicator for my increase or decrease. Because at the moment, I'm just using this one or minus one, which is fine. Um, but I like to indicate these in the uh, worksheet titles. and what you can use, you can use ASCII symbols or sort of Unicode characters in Tableau uh, to represent some of this. So you can use these in text, you can use them in calculated fields, you can use them in number formatting. So if I just go and grab one of these black circles and put this into my sheet here, so we could just say uh, increase. Um, and then I might want to just make sure these are the same colors. So my increase is going to be my blue-ish teal. My decrease is going to be that purple. Um, so you can use these symbols in many different places in your Tableau workbooks. So now that's just not a quite nice way of indicating um, what my colors represent. The final view that we need to build out, if we go back here, is looking at our 
just total sales for the year. We want to compare that with the previous year. So we'll just call this uh, total sales. And I can build out that sort of KPI by, I'm just going to drag my year of order date here. So I'm going to get my total sales for each of those years. Um, and I want this to be an increase on the previous year. So I'm just gonna make this a percentage difference. And I might want to use this calculation again. So I'm just gonna drag and drop it over here. And now my calculation can be used um, in other worksheets. So I can just call this um, year, year sales. So now I can actually see the expression that Tableau is computing when I set up that quick table calculation. Um, I'm going to use some of those ASCII characters again here. So in the default properties, my number format, um, I'm going to make my positive values just one decimal place, and I'm going to include um, a triangle. So we can change this here, and I can just paste that directly in. And then by adding a semicolon, I can specify how I would like the negative values to appear. So I'll grab a uh, down arrow and pop that into my sheet. If I hit OK, we're now seeing that represented in the worksheet. Um, I'm going to drag sales back out. I want that on text. Um, and then I'm just going to increase the size of some of these. So uh, maybe we'll make, I don't know, the sales value a little bit bigger, make that bold. And my percentage difference could just be a 15 or so. OK, so there's a few more things we want to do here. Um, I want my colors to represent the rest of the color scheme on my dashboard. So I'm just going to drag on my uh, calculation from before and now I want to hide all of the previous years but also maintaining my ca table calculation so once again I could use my current year check to hide some of those values so we'll just right click on false it will hide all of the false values um, just make this a bit bigger just do some cleanup of this worksheet okay so now we're going to combine these all together in a dashboard. So um, just for ease, we're going to call this 2022 sales. I often don't actually use the dashboard titles like this, but we're going quickly. Um, and then in this container, I'm just going to drop um, my monthly sales. I'm going to drop my, actually, undo that. Stick container on there. Um, I'll drop my monthly sales there. I'm going to drop my subcategory sales on top. Um, and we're going to get rid of this. We don't need it. Um, and then I'm going to put my total sales at the top. Make sure it's in the same. At the top there. Um, this doesn't look great to me, obviously, because you can't see the numbers. Um, but even if I space it out a little bit more, I don't really like that. Um, so a quick way I could change my total sales to a floating object is if I just pick this up and hold shift, I can drop it somewhere else on my dashboard. Um, so I might want to resize it. And now if I'm quite picky about where I put this on my view, if I press G, we can get some dashboard grid lines up so we can size. Well, I'll just drag and change that. But you can now move this with your arrow keys pixel by pixel if you want to move it in larger spaces 10 pixels at a time then you can hold shift and move that around um, until you've got your perfect alignment for your dashboard objects um, we're gonna give my bar chart or my bar chart a little more space and i actually want these bars to appear a little bit bigger so instead of i'm sure people have spent lots of time dragging this around to resize manually but you could actually um, if you hold control, I think it is on Windows here, I'm con holding control and command, I can use the arrow keys to just take those up in um, sort of size increases to just make that fill the space there. If I wanted my bars to be sort of a fixed size, but not just use entire view, um, 
that's another way that you could do that. Now, the final thing that we're going to do is, I'm sure lots of people have duplicated dashboards before, um, and there's a slight difference between duplicating and copying and pasting. So if I just duplicate this, I'm going to get exactly the same dashboard, but the worksheets are all exactly the same. So if I then wanted to say, make this a profit related dashboard, um, I would actually need to rebuild these sheets because, or at least duplicate the worksheets and put the new ones into this dashboard because at the moment, these are still the existing sales sheets. Whereas if I copy and paste this, now I'm gonna get all of those worksheets also duplicated. So now I could go and change these for profit in um, my new subcategory sales worksheets. But a better way to turn this into a really quick dashboard would be to maybe copy and paste that into a new workbook. I've got my uh, exactly the same dashboard there. But then if I wanted to turn this into a um, profit dashboard, I could just really quickly replace the references for sales. Um, everywhere that sales appears, we're going to replace that with profit. And now we have a profit focused dashboard. Um, so yeah, those were my quick Tableau tips. Um, thank you for listening. If you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Or if you have any further questions about the data school, the information lab, um, also happy to take those. Yeah, thanks, Jack. There was a, a lot of folks commenting in the um, chat about how great some of those tips were. <laughs> um, it reminded me of even a few, so which is pretty cool. Um, there was, uh, let's see, a couple questions. Um, someone did ask, I answered it, but I thought it'd be good to answer again live is, um, you know, when you showed how to hide the, the values, someone had asked how to unhide them. So I thought maybe it'd be helpful for other folks to know how to do that. Yeah, um, I can show you. If I just right click on the pill for that field, I can just do show hidden data and it will bring them back. Um, obviously the true false headers are hidden at the moment, but so you could just show the header to bring those back, but really easy, just two quick, two clicks, just show that hidden data again. Um, and someone else asked, could you share the website to use the symbol? Yeah, sure. Uh, wherever it is on all of my screens. <laughs> Here we go. To just drop it in the chat yeah that'd be perfect that's awesome there we go uh, so i can see someone just said will there be a recording this is being recorded right so yeah you it can is, follow and this it should be right afterward it should um shortly it'll process and then tableau will post it up onto their youtube channel i'm going to just drop that link in there too this should be where it ends up but um they kind of have all of our all the user groups in there. And I'm sure we'll, we'll be sharing it on, you know, social media and stuff. So cool. Let's see, we have another one. Where do you click to change the reference? For example, when you change sales to profit? Yes. So was I sharing my screen when I showed the show hidden data? I just realized. <laughs> um, okay. I just noticed that I wasn't actually doing that. So for when I was just talking through, I just right clicked here and you can show the hidden data. Um, and then to replace references on a field. So if I wanted to replace all of those, so for example, this is now my profit dashboard. We can see some of profit up here. If I wanted to change that back to sales, I would click the field that I want to replace so I'd right click on profit and then you can go down to replace references and then you pick the field that you would like to have in its place. Um, so I can now do sales and you'll see that this has changed to sales. And this is really useful when you're replacing data sources. If you've renamed a field to be something slightly different and you're suddenly getting those red pills and red exclamation marks everywhere and it's just because um, maybe you, you renamed last year in your new data set to be previous year or something. You could just replace the references on that broken field and then everything should fix itself. I had to do that a lot this morning, so. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> All right, thanks, Jack. Um, if anyone else has questions, you can keep dropping those in. Yeah. All right, very, very good. Thanks both of you for joining us and yeah. No problem. Awesome. And then we, last up we have Nicole. Are you there, Nicole? Hopefully. Yes, I am here. Um, let me share my screen. Uh, sorry. Hold music for something is happening. <laughs> All right, we'll give Nicole a minute. Can you see a slide presentation? Yes. Awesome. Okay. Then. We don't um, see you, but that's okay if you need to keep your camera off. Just I think I'll keep it off as to not complicate my life technologically here. Um, no worries. All right. You can get going. <laughs> <laughs> um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Nicole Mark. Um, I am a data visualization engineer at cart.com. My first non healthcare data visualization role ever. Um, but all of my previous has been healthcare related. Um, I have a presentation analyzing and visualizing public health. Um, we, I worked with Idaho State University, the Idaho Board of Pharmacy and um, Community Pharmacy Enhanced Services Networks, CPESNUA. Um, on a man published in the Journal of the American Pharmacy Association. Um, and I have a link to that somewhere in here. Except you aren't supposed to see this screen today, uh, but you were really supposed to get the presentation that I just described. Um, but life has been insanity. Um, I decided last night after listening to a podcast about uh, sleep to scrap my entire presentation um, because it didn't feel um, honest uh, to talk about a project I did last year that was successful when um, my life is falling apart and I think we lost your audio, Nicole. I don't think. I hear you now. Awesome, yay. Um, fabulous. Uh, one of the things is also an unstable internet connection. Um, and housing insecurity, uh, which is a, a new problem in my life. Um, I won't go- Nicole, we can't see your screen anymore. Oh, fun. Uh, let's see. <laughs> Sorry, y'all, and I'll get back to this. Okay, and can you see it now? Yep. Awesome. Um, so yeah, burnout, overwhelm, exhaustion, lack of quality sleep, um, my fun new uh, housing insecurity problem, which you wouldn't, expect I have a, a huge amount of privilege. I'm a white person from 
a family that has a reasonable amount of money. I make a reasonable amount of money, um, but this year has been challenging for many of us uh, financially. I live in Tampa, which is one of the most expensive cities in the country right now. Um, and uh, I won't go into the whole story, but I've been, I was living in Airbnbs right now. I've been in a La Quinta with my five dogs, a motel with my five dogs for five days. And uh, fortunately we're headed to a nicer Airbnb <laughs> later today. Um, I still feel so grateful though, because who has thousands of dollars to shell out for 30 days at an Airbnb at a time? Um, I, can only, I can't imagine, or I can't imagine <laughs> um, some of what uh, people are going through these days. Um, so the reason I, I decided to give this presentation rather than the one that seemed inauthentic and boring and irrelevant right now is um, partly because Brene Brown's work is important to me and has helped me um, uh, really realize the importance of authentic authenticity to, to me um, in my entire life, career, personal life, et cetera. Um, I love this quote of hers, uh, that authenticity is a collection of the choices that we have to make every day. It's about the choice to show up and be real, the choice to be honest, the choice to let our true selves be seen. So that's what I'm trying to do today. Um, I, so every, you know, every day on Twitter, we see the data fans, amazing accomplishments. And um, I've been so blessed by this community um supporting me uh, in a huge way uh, since i started doing data visualization um i i loved zach's presentation because it really encompassed that whole journey from like the person who has just started with tableau to the tableau visionary and um it really hit me uh, when he was talking about that comment that one of his bosses made um, uh, that I might have quit after that, but it was just a handful of people in the data fam that um, encouraged me even just a little bit. Like that was a nice color palette. Um, uh, I like what you did with the data. That was an interesting storytelling point. Um, so even those tiny little bits of encouragement that you can give to other people, no matter if you're brand new or a visionary, um, any level that you're at, it, it can really make a huge difference for people. Um, I started thinking when I was listening to this podcast about um, a young man who spent all of 11th and 12th grade um, living in his car with his mom. Um, the podcast is, uh, it's, uh, let's see, what is, what is it called? Oh my goodness, it is called have you been sleeping um i have a link to that in here somewhere as well um, but he spent all of 11th to 12th grade sleeping in, in his mom's car um and then he got a place of his own um, lost his minimum wage job and ended up living in his own car um putting himself through community college and just somehow never giving up but when he finally decided to be real, to be authentic with someone in um, a, a theater group that he, or excuse me, a comedy improv that he had joined. Um, that person did, you know, roughly the equivalent of what the data fam does for many of us every day, which is gave him a couch to sleep on so he could succeed in his schoolwork and in his, in his life. Um, so I just I have some actual data here um, that uh, mostly came from Vox.com, um, and that was the inspiration for the podcast. Uh, so nearly one in five hundred people in the United States lived in their cars in 2020 in January prior to the pandemic. Um, Thirty-four thousand young people under the age of 18 had no place to sleep on a given night in January of 2020. Currently, so in 2022, um, the average high schooler is getting 6.7 hours of sleep. And 
43.2% of students are getting less sleep since the start of the pandemic. These are public health problems where um, if you can't sleep and you don't have housing stability, um, yeah, Maslow's hierarchy of needs is absolutely in play. How can you be successful in your life? Um, somehow, like that uh, young man in the podcast, he managed to graduate school anyway, um, but with the help of his, his, his friends. Um, and then I found this quote from William Glasser, who's an American psychologist from the 1940s. Um, it's essentially the same thing Maslow said, but I, I sort of li I liked the wording a little bit more. Um, we're driven by five genetic needs, survival, love and belonging, power, freedom, and fun. So, but, and there's research into the importance of play um, more and more. Um, if, if you look around for some of that data or shoot me a message, I can send you uh, what I've found. And uh, finally, I'll do a couple of shameless plugs. Um, during the Tableau conference this year, um, we launched the Women in Data Viz Discord server. Um, I, I launched it, but then um, uh, Allison Wright quickly stepped in to help me uh, so much. She's a co-moderator now and has become a quick friend. And uh, it's become a space where we are not only exchanging ideas about data viz, about um, careers, about networking, um, but also a place where just supporting each other and having, <laughs> having fun. Um, sorry about my dogs there. Uh, the Women in Data Biz Discord Happy Hour is on July 21st at 7 p.m. And you can find me at all of these places, um, my website, Twitter, and my blog, Select, select Star from Data. Thanks so much, guys. <laughs> Thanks, Nicole. How about that in real life, right? Like, yeah, um, they're excited. Yeah. No, thanks for that. And, uh, you know, just want to say thanks, Nicole, for being authentic and changing up what we're going to do. Um, I'm sure your other presentation was wonderful as well, but it's good to hear um, just kind of putting us all back in place of, you know, we're all people. And, uh, you know, for those of you who work in healthcare, I kind of dropped this in the chat. Um, you know, we work with data about people every day. If you, if you work in the healthcare field, or I certainly do. And sometimes, uh, you know, it's important to also think about our own data and, you know, where we're at in our lives. And, when we need to take care of ourselves. So, you know, always kind of remember that. So if Anna has any questions for Nicole, you can certainly um, let us know. Otherwise, um, we've got a couple more things just to say before we wrap up. Um, hey, Nicole. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, <laughs> welcome back. We do have our next uh, virtual health hug in September. We have some great presenters, like I was saying, um, John Schwabish is gonna be on. Um, and now I'm blanking in there too. What are the other ones? Um, um, Bev, uh, yes. sorry, Bev, Dev. <laughs> Dev, Dev. Yes. And Nicole. Uh, yep, Dev and another Nicole. Yes, lots of Nicoles. Um, so you can join us then. And of course, we just wanna remind folks that if you want to present, you have a good presentation on healthcare data, on Tableau and anything of that nature, um, please reach out to Nicole, uh, myself, Mark Connolly, who's not on here, and uh, not here today, he's on vacation. And let us know, or um, if you have someone that you think is interesting, you want us to reach out to, we're happy to do that as well. Um, but always trying to get a variety of talks and people. So I think, uh, you know, early on in my uh, Tableau career, I think Simon reached out to me to present in like 2018 or 17. And I was like, what, really? So even if you don't think uh, you have something interesting, I'm sure you do. And we'd love to hear from you, particularly, you know, if you've never presented before, these are great opportunities to, to share your story, share information, um, share knowledge that you have. I think that's right. it then. Thanks everyone. Yeah, thanks. Have a great rest of your summer and happy 4th of July for those in the US. Have a great weekend. Bye. All right, bye.